All right, so this is the first lecture in a series of at least 42 lectures. Um, they're short. Uh, I originally created them to teach a course on Beyond the Blackboard uh, philosophers working in collaboration with each other. And it was for a school in Indonesia. And my main mission there was to take their political ideology, which is formulated in a document, the prelude to their constitution called Panchasila, and to link that with my own scholarship in ancient Greek civilization. So before knowing anything about Indonesia, I had spent many decades working on how Greek civilization starting in 800 BC, there was this huge um, emergence of a higher level of civilization. So my thesis is that the pre-Socratic philosophers, the speculators, people who speculated about the first principles of the universe, the Homer um, who wrote about the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, Hesiod who wrote the creation story, um, the Delphi, the Oracle at Delphi, and the, the refounding of the Olympics, they all occurred at about the same time. And my claim was that that was the point at which evolution had become complex enough so that peoples, the communities people were living in became complicated enough that they were able to understand that they are the creature that can understand the universe because the universe is understandable. So there are patterns out there. And this intuition, which Aristotle says, after gathering together all the knowledge based on information and pattern recognition, that's cognition, episteme, then suddenly the mind thinks itself. So there's this higher leap in consciousness from just knowing what's going on around you to realizing that you know that you know. And then you can become really deliberate about seeking out patterns and educating other people in these patterns. And so Hesiod was interested in patterns in the evolution of human culture and also mistakes people make and judgments, good judgments and bad judgments, better ways of living and worse ways of living. And also at the same point was this recognition of the difference between living together just to survive or just for economic purposes and living together to give each other opportunity to understand the world and all the higher order activities we can get involved in. So that was the big revelation. And from my point of view throughout these lectures, this is a bridge between what has been separated, religion from science. So for the Greeks, it was this evolutionary process. It was natural but also led to this personification of the deities, of gods. So their religion is not separated from their being as biological creatures. So I call it spiritual humanism. So at that point, when you have that recognition, you realize people are not completely human unless they live for the sake of something greater than themselves. So, for example, uh, a mother lives for the sake of her children. Or, I mean, that's one of the capacities you have to dedicate yourself to the survival of your children. 
So all the Olympic deities, the myths, and again, Hesiod sort of systematized the mythology so that it would be organized and it would focus on living for the sake of integrating nature and culture, um, taking care of the next generation, beauty, truth, justice. I could go into all of that, but the, all 12 of them are examples of what people today live for. And they're also examples of when somebody is so obsessed about their own concern, which is a perfectly legitimate concern, they could go to an extreme and damage people or the other gods who also have a legitimate claim. So that the myths are trying to tell us that we need to recognize all of these higher order ways of being. And we also need to compromise and integrate them into our culture and into our own lives. So anyway, that's enough. But my work in general has been all about how the Greeks started out in 800 BC, gradually developed their culture to a higher and higher level until you get to Athens, which would be the culmination of a free and open society. And then within 30 years of defeating the Persian and having a golden age, 30 years it took before it got so corrupted that they became unstable, the greed and the power hunger and the self-indulgence and the tyrannical desires of the Athenians that they used the system, tried to wrap the system around their, their own finger to get the money, the power, the influence, whatever they wanted, Nobody was taking care of the well-being of the city as a whole. It became unstable, a power-hungry political operative said, if you vote for me, I will fix it. I'll fix our problems. I'll get us back to traditional Athenian values of blind loyalty, no questions asked, of the leaders, blind obedience to whatever the religious leaders say the gods want, blind loyalty to family, even if your family is unjust. Those So Critias said, if you vote for me, I'll get you back to those traditional values. Those were exactly not Athens' traditional values. Athens' values were you should care about the community, even if your family is wrong, even if your religious leaders are wrong, even if your political leaders are wrong, you have to question them. So, so, but the Athenians corrupted it so badly that they became unstable. This political operative, this tyrant, tyrannical soul convinced them he would fix it and they elected him. And they had a, a reign of terror for nine months. And gradually, then they fought back. And the Democrats uh, took over again. And then they ended up killing Socrates, the Democrats. But that's another story. The main point is, here's how you develop a democracy. Here's how you lose a democracy. And in my experience teaching the lecture of the rise and fall of Athenian democracy. I gave that lecture in China, in, oh, Prague, in, in Greece many times because the Greeks really liked my work throughout the U.S. Um, I was in Russia. I was in um, Indonesia. So the Indonesians were very impressed. Also, they really liked uh, when I taught them about Greek civilization. So this series of lectures isn't just for Indonesians. It's for anybody who really wants to develop and preserve their free and open society. And at this moment in history, of course, 
it's 2024. It's a few months before the American election where Donald Trump is running for a second time against Joe Biden. And Europe is coming apart. I mean, every so-called developed nation that had a free society is being threatened and undermined by the same kind of political operatives. All of the developing countries that were at one time trying to develop toward democracy, all of that's being undermined. So I think this series of lectures is relevant to more than just Indonesians. Panchasila has principles that are very consistent with Aristotle. And so everything I taught about Aristotle is um, true not only of Panchasila and Indonesians, but anybody else who would like to listen to these lectures. Um, I'll put a title on them and you don't wanna listen to all of them. And I'll, at the end of one lecture, I will tell you what's coming in the next one. So again, if, if you wanna skip a few, that's fine. 42 is quite a lot. I think they're about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They're not very long, average 10 to 12 PowerPoint slides. Mostly, I try to just read the slides. So you can just read the slides, think them over and teach your own class, or if you can use them for things you're writing. Um, I, do, I don't do a full bibliography, but I usually refer to the book and you can find it online and get the bibliographic information. I usually have the page numbers. Um, so just trying to make this um, available to anybody who is involved in what I think is the most important project anybody can be involved in, which is the creation of an international sustainable civilization, or we will all perish. It's as simple as that. I have been following environmental problems for 57 years, and, and it's very bleak. Uh, we went the wrong direction. For the last 57 years, I thought we should go green, we should go green, and we did not. And so now we've got trouble, and the U.S. and China are in a big race for who goes green first. India is getting in there. Whoever does is going to take control of the economic system, and at this point, politics too. So it's all really important, and the Greeks were very much assumed the integration of nature and culture because that culture existed before the enlightenment had a whole ideology of exploiting nature for human well-being as god's will you know the greeks didn't even consider that i don't think but they pretty easily condemned it so all of this is very relevant to what I think every scholar, um, every person in higher education, no matter if it's science, social science, or humanities, some branch of their work should really be focused on the development of international sustainable civilization. So here we go. Um, this is the title of creating a sustainable international civilization today, collaboration between diverse traditions. And so the original one was the role of Indonesia's Panchasila in the transition from the modern Western worldviews, various modern Western views to a systems worldview. And I'll explain that as we go. This is my name, I have a YouTube channel which is focused on the legacy of ancient Greek civilization. So I have playlists. There's one of them is Plato. One is Aristotle in the United Nations. There's a one on uh, Aristotle in Indonesia. This will be the second one related specifically to Panchasila. But um, anyway, there's Jungian, Carl Jung's archetypal psychology I worked a lot on. Greek tragedy I worked a lot on, um, anyway, the United Nations. So 
there's a lot of uh, material there that you, again, you don't have to listen to all my 76 videos. I give you a lot of cheat sheets. You sort of pick and choose what you like. Okay. Um, all right. So the next sort of framing for this series of lectures is a book by uh, a recently deceased prominent intellectual, cultural, political, well, mostly intellectual and cultural leader of Indonesia named Ahmad, S I don't know, I'm just going to call him Mr. Marif. <laughs> and he was 70 years old when he wrote the book. And he was looking back and thinking of his vision for Indonesia. Indonesia only achieved independence in 1945. So he died at age 70 in 1924. So he must have been born right around the time Indonesia Republic was born. So he must have had a lot of hopes and dreams for Indonesia. Some of them have played out, but again, most of them haven't gone as far as he wanted. So I will quote from him just to show that I'm I'm supporting this effort by Indonesians. But if anyone from another country wants to read uh, Mr. Marif's views and finds them compatible, they can take this whole series of lectures and tie it to um, Panchasila or Islam. So Mr. Marif is a committed Muslim, but um, he links Islam with humanity. And this, I, my claim is that it is a very Greek view of humanity and Indonesian identity. So right away, he understands history. You're supposed to study it with a mission. And I think today historians should study history with a mission, but not a Western colonialism mission, <laughs> but a mission of how it is we've come to this point where we've almost destroyed life on earth. What were the touch points that got us there and how do we get out of it? Um, but there's many kinds of lessons to learn from history. It's just that you don't have to apologize for having a mission. You can have a mission of how racist the tradition was, uh, all traditions or sexist. Um, there's missions on both sides. There's the missions, you know, that preserve white male Western supremacies, but there's the mission that that reexamines them and criticizes them and replaces them with something that's more accurate. Okay, so this book, he says, is written as a tribute to Indonesia and to Islam. Uh, Indonesia is 88% Muslim. It has the most moderate Muslims in the world. I think it has more than the whole Mideast. Um, it is the fourth largest country. It is the third largest democracy, although... Um, Mr. Modi in India is becoming more and more authoritarian. If the U.S. elects Mr. Trump, he is very authoritarian in what he promises, what he plans to do. So if he actually uh, does what he says he's going to do, we will have lost our democracy. And Indonesia, their politicians are... Uh, you know, they pander sometimes to the more extreme Muslims, but they're not, they are not as far out as Trump or Modi, as far as I can tell. So at this particular moment, in six months, they might be the world's number one democracy, as far as I know. <laughs> and I keep telling my Indonesian colleagues, you know, that you shouldn't just think of yourself as backward. You shouldn't, you know... I had a lot of students who thought, oh, America, I was on a Fulbright there. That's how I got there. 
oh, you know, America, we want to be like America. And I kept saying, wait, wait, we all have the same problems. I, you can come to America and study, but go back home and make Indonesia a good country. You know, you don't have to be a wannabe American. And that was in 2012. And it's become more and more obvious that we're all in this together. We're all trying to save our free societies. And the reason why we're able to talk to each other is because both of us live in societies that are free. And if Trump gets elected, I might get in trouble for talking to Muslims or my students might not want to listen to me. I mean, who knows? On the other hand, Indonesia, you know, if they become an Islamicist state, there's trouble. But so far, you know, here we are, we're free and we're talking to each other about all these ideas. And uh, Mr. Marif, highly respected uh, intellectual leader in Indonesia says that none of the five principles of Panchasila, if understood properly and fully, needs to be questioned from the angle of Islamic theology. The Islam that must be offered is an Islam that's prepared to walk hand in hand with the values of Indonesianness and the values of civilized humanity. So every, I'm going to show in these lectures just briefly, every religious tradition has a humanistic branch and then it has an intolerant uh, branch, at least one intolerant branch. So, so as long as we have this humanist foundation, which I have, I have studied the Greek version of the humanist foundation, but I, it certainly is not the only one, I'm sure. But as long as we have it, then we can get along and we can form this international sustainable civilization. Okay, so my understanding of ancient Greeks is with a mission. I think we can learn lessons. The Greek model of nature, human nature, and the human condition is a model of a flourishing free and open society. Now, I'm very aware that the Greeks have been exposed and deconstructed as uh, having a cultural superiority complex. Uh, Westerners used Aristotle as a bludgeon to justify colonialism. Aristotle was sexist. Aristotle was, I mean, there are quotes in Aristotle that would lead one to think he was racist. And, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> either you're Greek or you're barbarian for starters, <laughs> But the tragedians, the poets, are always exposing that. It's brilliant the way they do it. And again, I've written books on this, but they'll have a character. For example, Odysseus. He criticizes Hecuba. Oh, you're a bunch of barbarians. You break hospitality agreements. So this is what you deserve. Well, then two scenes later, his boss, Agamemnon, the leader of the Greeks or the Achaeans, he breaks hospitality agreements <laughs> in a way that's even worse given the circumstances. And the poets are always doing that. They're trying to call out the sexism, the racism, the classism, the superior superiority complexes, but they don't do it by preaching at you. They do it by showing you these people. And you have to go down to the taverna after you watch it and talk to other people and say, wasn't that funny the way Odysseus did that? And then Agamemnon, what hypocrites they are. And somebody else at the taverna is going to say, I didn't notice that. You know, I think Agamemnon is great. And I was like, wait, and then you have all these debates. And that's how you actually learn how to develop practical wisdom. Think twice, think twice, live an examined life, like examine your life. 
And that's what the poets are trying to kick in to get you to reflect because it's the only way to develop and preserve a democracy. But anyway, <laughs> you got to go to the rest of the, you know, I got my YouTube channel, otherwise I talk all day. So I have argued that we don't just go back to the Greeks. We have to go forward to systems thinking. Systems thinking, the main premise is we have to integrate nature and culture. And then we can go back and find out how we got to where we got and how do we get out of there. Um, so, so my mission is very compatible with Marif's and I'm sure with other people who could take advantage of this lecture series. So here are the principles, just very briefly, and I'll keep coming back to them. The first one is they're, they're going to have a republic based on the belief in God. Now their president, Mr. Sukarno, had studied in the West. He knew all about the American Declaration of Independence, the French, you know, all that stuff. He knew enlightenment thinking. He just chose to have a republic based on religious pluralism. I think because he wanted something that was workable in his cultural context. So um, I think it's false for Westerners to think it's impossible to have a religious-based uh, republic. So, I mean, I mean, given their experience in Europe, religion was horrible and it was used as a weapon to fight wars. And it's perfectly understandable that the America's founding fathers would want to separate church and state. Uh, but it's also understandable that if you can get Indonesians to think of the belief in God in a very pluralistic way. And there are many organizations in Indonesia, around the world, who are studying, promoting religious pluralism. So I think Indonesia should step up as a major source of scholarship and uh, conferences uh, about religious pluralism that has very highly high people with a lot of expertise getting together and creating this whole body of uh, knowledge that again is part of creating a sustainable uh, global civilization. So Aristotle was a monist. He thought there is a unifying force, as I said. So when I read Ponchicilla number one, I said, oh, that's Aristotle. And then Ponchicilla number two is humanitarianism, a just and civilized humanity. Well, as I said, <laughs> that's very Greek. And it's um, there are modern and contemporary views of humanis humanism that are compatible with religious pluralism, but there are also some that are not. They're just ant antithetical. They just uh, despise religion, they mock it out, whatever. So we have to distinguish those. Um, people who think the only way forward to develop an international civilization is to throw religion out the window. <laughs> That's not going to get us anywhere. Um, I think it's more true. It's it's more true, actually, but it's it's neither politically savvy nor accurate to think you have to throw out these ancient traditions. Though I would call them the wisdom traditions, not religions. The word religion was a Western word superimposed on the countries that they colonized in order to denigrate them and to argue that it's only modern Protestantism that believes in exploiting nature for human well-being and that's why we can come to your country where you have this backward religion and it's anti-science and we can take your resources and we can do all that and we can boss you around because you're 
less developed or even incapable of this higher order thinking. So, um, so there is a view of humanism in the West that would be incompatible with this wisdom traditions and the understanding of belief in God as this way that is not at all anti-intellectual. It's just anti-using knowledge simply to exploit nature. That's what the wisdom traditions did not do. Okay, the third one is unity in diversity, which reminded me right away of E Pluribus Unum, but it's also Aristotle said that a polis, a political association, is not a unity, it's a pluralism. People have different callings, different ways to contribute to the well-being of the whole. The fourth principle is gaining wisdom through deliberations among representatives. So you elect your representatives and they gather around a table and talk and they come to conclusions, practical wisdom after deliberating. So the wisdom traditions, but the Greeks very much so. I don't know the other ones well enough, so I don't want to make too many claims about them. But the Greek especially is dialectical. So even the 12 gods are always arguing with each other. And then people are arguing with each other because some god has possessed them. And all of them have a claim, you know, all of them have a have an argument. And some are better than others. So this whole notion of deliberation is very Greek. And that's right in one of the four principles of Panchasila. The goal of all deliberation in political life is human flourishing. You want as many people as possible to flourish to the highest level possible. Given your resources and a whole lot of other situations, obstacles. And then the last one is a social contract that the government actually owes you education, healthcare, infrastructure, uh, some basics. And then you are responsible to give back to, and lift up other citizens. And university professors are required to be involved in a university community engagement projects, which I think should be the case. I wish in Europe and the US, every college educated professor had to have one branch of their scholar scholarship tied to a community engagement project. We would have journals and publishers who would publish it, it would get respect, and those scholars would get out of their offices and relate to people. I think it's a terrible problem that undermines democracy everywhere. That scholarship has been allowed to turn into these very isolated silos, rabbit holes, people talk in jargon, and they've lost empathy for the rest of the public. They, I think they're part of the problem of polarization and um, the decline of democracies. I think college professors, they get a lot of money. Taxpayers pay a lot of money for them to go to college. Or if they go to private school, there's a lot of government funded programs to keep those schools alive. There's a lot of private donations. Well, they donate because they assume the professors have something to offer the public, but then they get there and they they don't defend what it is they're doing that it will make public life better, was make the community better. So when I read that, I thought right away of Aristotle because there was an, an ethos of the obligation of the nobility. If you're college educated, you have an obligation to give back. And that was considered paternalistic or colonial, but it doesn't have to be. The only thing worse than that 
is that if you're smart, you can get rich and you don't have any obligation to the public other than to keep getting richer. And that was Milton Friedman. That was uh, extreme um, neoliberal capitalism, which is not what Adam Smith thought. He thought the public needed to be educated. It's not what Frederick Hayek thought. Those people all thought the public, everyone should get an education. That is not what's happening now. It's just money sticking to money. And I think the universities are either supported by the rich in their research project, or they're turning the other way. They're putting the head in the sand. And so I have a lot of respect for the Indonesian government to expect that of university professors. Okay, what is the definition of a free society? I think this is another thing that has really gone by the wayside and it's extremely important. So, so the thing about philosophers is that they force you to, to answer questions you didn't think were problematic, right? Like, what is being? <laughs> what does it mean to be? That's actually a very important question, but I'm not going to go into it. What is a chair? You know, what is a chair? But in this case, it's, well, what is justice? You know, people can talk about it forever. They know Donald Trump is unjust. Well, and then you ask, well, what is justice? That can't necessarily answer. If you don't know what justice is, how can you know that Mr. Trump is unjust? So, um, so Aristotle has a definition, which I don't think most Americans, even it even occurred to them. And I'm not quite sure what they would think if it did. And if you don't even believe in a political life in Aristotle's sense, there's no reason not to have an authoritarian, as long as you get fed, <laughs> as long as you get, I mean, Supposedly, if you're economically better off, people are voting for Trump, many of them, just because they think they'll be economically better off. And the other things just don't matter, which is what it means is people only think of political life as the village. It's only about economics. And it's not. So, so this is a very important distinction. The family is just biological. The village is just economic, but the polis is special. This is where we really become human and we can explore science freely without being forced. Sorry, in China, there's, you know, a lot of science, a lot of tech, but it's in the service of the government. And right now they're doing a lot better in tech than we are. And they're preparing their people to be successful in the economic system. Whereas our society has been taken over by rich people that got rich in a fossil fuel economy. And they are really taking us down both economically and culturally, right? They don't care if they end up with Trump, if he'll cut taxes for the rich and support fossil fuel billionaires. So, so it's really important to distinguish and it's important to value free scientific inquiry. So trained scientists can explore what they think would benefit the public. They don't have to kowtow to people who are rich. Free artistic expression. Uh, artists can freely express what they think are the diseases of our society, how they think we should live or not live, or what stories need to be told, whose voices are not being heard. Free speech, freedom of association, a free press, the freedom to participate in public life and in the political affairs of the society through elections and uh, being a juror who applies the laws and um, 
appointing, you know, once you get elected, you appoint people who enforce the laws. In a free society, in a polis, everyone who exercises any kind of authority should be transparent. They should have to explain why they're doing what they're doing and accountable. Somebody questions them, they have to have an answer. Um, okay, and this is really important. It's important as a parent, as a coach, as a teacher, as any kind of role model, as a business owner, as a political leader, as a religious leader, any kind of authority. You have to be transparent and accountable. Otherwise, the, the power gets corrupted by the desire for money, for power, for fame, or just self-indulgence, pleasure. All right. Applying the lessons, okay? In this particular relation between the US and Indonesia, both of the countries claim to have free and open societies. Both of them are very diverse. Um, although Indonesia is way more diverse than the US, but the US prided itself on its diversity back in the old days. Um, they both, the founders understood it. They needed to cultivate humanistic virtues and a humanistic way of life. And um, in the next lecture, I'll discuss Aristotle's theory of the virtues. Um, and, and there is a lecture where I talk about the US founders, how they wanted to establish virtue clubs based on Confucius Analects, something other than Christianity because they just want to cultivate these virtues and have people living a certain way so they can create a polis and not necessarily tying them to their particular religious denomination because they don't want them to think people from another religion or another denomination are not virtuous, okay? You can cultivate virtue in your church, that's fine, you probably should do that, but you can recognize virtue in somebody with a different uh, denominational background and a different even religious tradition or even someone that's atheist. So you have to have an understanding of what virtue is. Our founders are, were very concerned that people did. Um, and the Mr. Marif and the leaders in Indonesia also are very concerned that Indonesians develop this understanding of humanitarianism in principle number two that can enable them to overcome any kind of religious intolerance. Okay. So my goal and Marif's goal was to create an educational system in his case, to be used by Indonesian Muslims, actually in my case too, beginning with those studying in institutions run by Muhammadiyah, he says, we need to make a serious effort to think of an alternative system of education for you know, Indonesia's future. Now, Muhammadiyah is one of two moderate Muslim organizations in Indonesia and Muhammadiyah has a number of Islamic schools. I actually was taught at one of them for six weeks. And um, he says, once we have Muhammadiyah's philosophy of education, no matter how imperfect a construction it still is, you can design a curriculum upon it. And so one purpose of these lectures is to give you ideas about what that curriculum would be like. Um, in many academic disciplines and many professions, the worldview of the West is being replaced by the system's view. And that has been my goal. So I think we all need to regroup our curricula to have a systems way of thinking. So the United Nations has 18 sustainable development goals. One of them, number four, is about education. So the United Nations is concerned with developing a system of education for sustainable development. 
And there have been essays, books written about the virtues and sustainability. And the people writing those articles are from many different disciplines. One of them is arguing for Aristotle to be a foundation for the educational system in the UN Sustainability Development Goals. So all of this should come together. Okay, so um, this is my conclusion. I reiterate again that my scholarship's been focused on this. I hope it can be helpful in helping Indonesians work out a curriculum. And the two moderate organizations in Indonesia, sometimes they, they go at each other, which Mr. Marif was not happy about. He wanted this curriculum to actually apply to both. And so if I come from an even more remote point of view, then I could say, well, of course, I think they should get together because I don't even know how they distinguish between each other. And so I don't bring with me any baggage of intolerance between them. And as an outsider, I am very concerned that the moderates do need to work together to keep Indonesia's um, democracy going, just like I think in my own country, the moderate Republicans need to speak out and not support Trump. And um, the moderate Democrats should get together and um, avoid uh, giving in to more extreme factions so that we can preserve our own democracy. So that's the end of the first lecture. And I hope people listening like it. And you can always contact me. Um, okay.